Newsweek friends, hello. This is Dory Clark, and I am so happy to be here with my friend Erica Dewan. Erica is the author of Get Big Things Done, and she is also the author of the forthcoming book, Digital Body Language. Erica, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. Yeah, it's it's great to have you here. And I want to make sure to welcome everybody who is here tuning in live to our live stream. Uh, we'd love to hear who you are. And so please feel free to chime in into the chat box, you know, say hi, let us know where you're uh, where you're coming in from. We'll uh, we'll give you a shout out. And we definitely want to make sure that we are answering your questions throughout the half hour that we have here together. Um, but so as we're getting started and as folks are are chiming in, Erica, I would love to uh, to actually just uh, just ask you. So you have a book that is coming out about digital, digital body language. It is, in fact, going to be called Digital Body Language. And this is not something that you ginned up in the past three months. I remember actually talking to you uh, several years ago and you were, you were like, Oh, here's the idea for my next book. And I'm like, wow, that sounds great, Erica. I'm thinking to myself, like, it's a little niche, but okay. <laughs> and all of a sudden Erica Dewan has the, the most uh, absolutely prescient view of humanity. So what do you mean by digital body language? And also what does this mean? Because right now we're basically communicating like this and what does body language even mean? Because you're seeing my face really big and your face really big. You can't even see what I'm doing or if I'm even wearing pants now. I am, but you can't tell that for sure. So what does body language mean in a world like this, Erica? So Dory, here's the reality. We know that roughly three fourths of face to face communication is traditional body language, our facial cues, our gestures, our intonation, our tone. But the reality is, is that pre COVID-19, roughly 70% of team communication was already virtual. We were emailing, we were conference calling, uh, we had screens in front of us, even in live meetings that were changing our traditional body language. Today, that number is 100%. We are working on video calls, uh, on phone calls, and emails, and Slack at a new level than ever before. And the real solution to the sense of confusion, misunderstanding, anxiety, and challenges we face when working virtually is through what I call digital body language. Digital body language are the cues and signals that we send in our digital communication that make up the subtext of our messages. So everything from the subject line that we use to our response time, did we reply in two minutes, in five minutes, in five days, to who we include uh, on the two line, on the CC line, on the BCC line, to the punctuation we use. Did we use multiple emojis or a curt period at the end of a text? To today, really risen through COVID, our expressions in video calls as well and the cues that we see in video that through my research we've discovered are very different than traditional body language cues. Ah, that's really interesting, Erica. So when you're talking about digital body language, body language in the in the in the virtual world is actually can be something like text. It can be, uh, you know, the emojis that that's really interesting. So it's a form of body language in, in terms of just the level of formality that you're using, whether I'm saying, Hey, Erica, or dear Erica, is that, is that the basic idea? That's exactly right. And, and really digital body language is how we project through the body of our language. And so it is not only about how do I have great posture and eye, con eye, eye contact on a Zoom call. That was not really a question even you know, eight months ago. Now it very much is a question and it is a key part of using digital body language skills. But digital body language spans the entirety of our written communication, of our verbal communication, of our video communication and beyond. And it enables, it allows us to either win or lose trust in the marketplace. It enables us to either win or lose connection with others. Uh, and it has led to you know, a whole new level of importance, especially during this time of change. I'll give you two examples if it's helpful. The first example I wanna share is uh, from an executive uh, that I worked with uh, who was 
sending a text message to one of his leaders. We'll call his leader Tom. Now he sent the text message saying, do you wanna speak Wednesday or Thursday? And Tom's response to that was yes. Now, we all know that we have often been in situations where we rush to respond to something. We may not actually read the message. But the reality is, is that actually today, reading carefully is the new version of listening. Uh, as we listen, as we read multiple emails, multiple agendas, mul multiple calendar requests, we have to be much more conscious. So really being self-aware of your digital body language. Are you clear? Are you showing that you've read things will lead to a whole new level of understanding, collaboration, and trust in your work environments. I'll give you one more example that's video communication. I um, have a client who is struggling um, with engagement of her team, getting people on video calls. Uh, and one of the things that we actually realized is in video communication, there are a lot of nuances. Uh, there are screen freezes. There's you're on mute interruptions that actually can get in the way of groupthink and psychological safety when people are brainstorming on, on ideas. There, there's also the fact that it's not natural for us to actually see our own video on the camera while we're trying to talk to other people. So it's leading to a whole new level of challenges related to video communication. And uh, one of the examples from my client was I want everyone on video. My, my team members aren't joining on video. And one of my key recommendations related to that is you actually have to prioritize what should be on video and what's a phone call versus what's an email. And that's actually sort of a rule around digital body language. And the reason why is uh, not everything needs to be a video communication. I always say, if you're gonna do video, do it before 2 p.m. so people don't have that Zoom exhaustion later in the day. The other thing we, we've seen uh, in the research is that introverts, are more likely to prefer phone communication than always being on video. It's similar to always feeling like you need to network in the room on video and you're you're concerned about, you know, how you're looking, looking at other people's faces versus just sharing what you think, which is much easier to do by phone. So those are just some examples of the nuances of digital body language. And in my work, I really focus on helping people become first self-aware of their own digital body language cues, what actually creates trust and connection and what doesn't, but then also knowing your audience uh, to most effectively in every single channel that we, we work in today, from email to text to video to phone, engage effectively in our new era. Yeah, thank you, Erica. That's that's so interesting. I mean, essentially, what I'm hearing is that body language, you know, the the uh, the function that body language used to provide in the actual world, the real world, was helping to convey emotions, helping to magnify things, giving people an impression of you. And so when we talk about digital body language, it's not just how are you using your hands or, you know, do you look bored on the Zoom call? It's much broader. And it's what are the what are the aspects around your communication that are helping to amplify either positively or negatively what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, that's right. And, and in many ways, uh, it's it's more important than ever for all of us to understand what signals we may be broadcasting, even if we don't intend to, and, and be able to really think about how to effectively engage people also based on our the power level and power dynamics, as well as the trust level we have with those individuals. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to greet some of the great folks who are tuning in live for us. Thank you so much, people. We're so happy. Maya's here. We have Deepak from India. Uh, we have Elliot, uh, who's joining us. Diane from Cleveland. We've got friends from New Jersey. We have Lisa from Tampa. Uh, Terrence is here from Annapolis. Uh, we have, uh, oh my goodness, we have Jeannie, who's here from Fiery, Oregon. My goodness, stay safe, uh, Jeannie. We're thinking of you. Uh, Ashley is here. This is great. Uh, so we're really happy to have you. Please feel free if you're tuning in just now, let us know where you are from. And I see some questions, Erica, that have come in that are really interesting. Uh, we had one here that uh, that I think is you know, kind of fascinating. Uh, one LinkedIn user wants to know, is it possible to fake digital body language? What is, what is faking it actually even mean uh, in digital body language? I guess, you know, if you're, if you're faking body language in the real world, maybe it's like, okay, I actually can't stand you, but I'm, yeah, good, good, Erica. That's great. Uh, but how, how does faking or not faking play out when we think about, uh, when we think about the, uh, the digital realm? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I don't think that you can fake digital body language. I think you can adapt your bit digital body language, just like you adapt your traditional body language uh, when you're connecting with individuals. So for example, um, fa in face-to-face -face traditional body language, if you're meeting someone for the first time, you may shake their hand, um, greet them with direct eye contact, uh, you know, and sit down at the table with a clear agenda to run through a meeting with a PowerPoint presentation. If you're meeting with someone that you've known for a long time, you may see them and hug them. You may be so excited. You may be moving your hands more. Um, you may, it, especially in female friendships, um, you may see an intonation or a different tone in your voice. Uh, and the way that you may engage in that interaction could be very different. Now, if you move to the world of digital body language, you do the same. First off, um, based on the level of formality, you change your written, verbal, and video communication. So for example, if you're meeting someone that you've never met before, maybe that is, maybe it is senior to you in a company or someone you're trying to sell something to, first you would uh, send an email to their assistant to get on their calendar. You wouldn't just send them a quick text. Um, second, when you're engaging with them, you would make sure you have your slides, you would go through a clear agenda, you would make sure that your video, if it's online, um, looks presentable and professional in your engagement. Uh, you would check out your virtual background. Uh, and if this is someone who, you know, is a longtime colleague or say your assistant uh, or your teammate, you may just jump on the phone because you're running around in your room at workspace while homeschooling your kid or not have an agenda and send a one-liner email saying, call me right now. Those are some of the examples of how, you know, there's no right or wrong. There's no fake or authentic digital body language. What, what is important is to understand what is, what is your true style? What is what, what you naturally like to do to express yourself? And then how do you adapt or know your audience to best engage with them? So, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of being yourself and being, you know, your unique, um, your unique person. I also know that through my research that there are certain situations where there are digital unconscious biases. So, for example, um, there was a research study done to show that um, when younger women versus older women and men of all ages sent multiple emojis in a workplace communication, Younger women were more likely to seem incompetent and men were more likely to seem friendly. And this is just an example of how digital body language plays out in our new world. So the, the point is not to say you have to be masculine or you have to be Western, especially if you're from an Eastern culture, or you have to act like a baby boomer when you have a millennial style. The, the key is to understand where you can be authentic understand what power or trust level it, the, it is with that individual, and then, you know, know your audience and the best ways to engage with them. Yeah, I think I think that's really important, Erica. I, I know for me personally, when I think about my digital body language, I'm a little uh, exclamation mark happy. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm an American, I'm a girl. And so I like to, you know, oh, I can't wait to see you looking forward. And uh, I actually have to go through and, and comb uh, afterwards. And, uh, and sometimes depending on the recipient, uh, say, you know what, I should probably take out maybe two thirds of these exclamation marks. Is that, is that, is that common? Is that sort of what we need to start doing? You know, I think uh, in all truth, I think you don't have to take out the exclamation marks. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the situation and it depends on uh, two things. So in every communication that we have in person and digitally, we're answering two questions that shape how we use digital body language signals in our written verbal video messages. The first is who has more or less power? So if this is someone that you've never met before, you may adapt, obviously, to have more formal than the multiple exclamation points versus a different situation. And then second is how much do we trust each other? Do we have high trust or do we have low trust right now? And this all shapes uh, the cues and signals that we send. And so I'd encourage all of us to really think about, uh, you know, being able to analyze situations better and be more thoughtful about adapting, but not letting go of what may be unique to our style, especially as we grow power and grow trust with individuals. 
Yeah, great point, Erica. Thank you very much. And I just want to encourage all of you guys, uh, if you are not already, uh, follow Erica on LinkedIn. You can open up a new window in your browser. You can go follow her uh, on LinkedIn. And also, of course, make sure as you're doing this that you are following Newsweek and that you are also following me. And uh, if you want to learn more about these uh, weekly sessions that I do for Newsweek, you can actually subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter. It is Dory Clark dot com slash LinkedIn, and you will get notified about this and receive other great articles. Uh, so you can just go there and hit the subscribe button. Uh, so Erica, thank you so much. There's some other great questions coming in and please feel free, uh, viewers, if you have questions, type them into the chat box. Also let us know, uh, where you are calling in from or, you know, not calling per se, but you know, Hey, we're talking digital body language. We have Sylvia here from Spain. We have Patty from Cleveland, Tennessee. We have Dr. Theodora from uh, Athens. That's great. I'm a Theodora too. So props. Theodora is in the house. We have uh, Pedro from Por Portugal and Sam from Irvine, California. Kevin's from North Carolina. We are very glad to have all of you. Uh, so a question that came up, Erica, that I thought was really interesting. Uh, this is from Veronica. She wants to know, how do you get yourself to slow down in reading and responding? If, if now we have to pay so much more attention in these virtual worlds, how do we actually do it when the impulse might be to, oh, I got to get it done, got to dispatch it? You know, it's a great question. Uh, and one of my key tenants that's also in a digital tool, uh, body language toolkit that um, I will share with all of you at the end of this session is what I call hold your horses. So, you know, the reality is, is that actually less haste equals more speed in digital communications, in any communication. Uh, the pressure to communicate quickly, especially right now, can lead us all into multitasking, into making mistakes, into not taking time to really think uh, pause to become more strategic in our messages. And um, I have so many stories about this, but I have um, in my research, I have a curve that's called response time and anxiety level. And we see, you know, if we don't hear back from someone first, you know, we think, okay, it's been a couple of days. It's okay. Then a few days later, we start to wonder what's going on. Then we start to get mad or read into the last conversation for clues. Then we finally just say, okay, they must've forgot. It's time to follow up. Now, the reality is, is that right now that digital anxiety is wasting a lot of time. A recent study showed that the amount of drama um, time that is wasted in the workplace is up to two hours and 20 minutes every day. So, you know, my um, my recommendation is to really create a mindset with your for yourself and with your colleagues where you're practicing pausing to be more strategic. So, for example, um, some best practices you can use uh, with your team or with colleagues you work with. What I like to recommend is create uh, response time expectations in all emails. So people don't feel pressured to respond immediately. Um, so, for example, you can use an acronym like 4D, which means I need this in four days or 2H, which means I need this to, in two hours. This is actually urgent. So, first of all, people know how to prioritize, but they also have um, that those guardrails to take the time to really think. The other thing I recommend is if you're leading a team, do not create a culture where you send out a thought and then ask everyone, you know, what do you think without creating norms around response times and giving them time to think. So what often happens is a leader sends out a message. Three people feel like they have to rush to respond quickly, not taking the time to think. They all say, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. And then it's much harder for the fourth person to actually say, no, I disagree or no, I need more time. We also see this with introverts where on Monday you'll have a video meeting and everyone has to share their thoughts, but introverts didn't have time to actually process and think. And one best practice you can use is say, you know what, I know we've discussed this out loud, but if you have another idea or another thought on this, please send me an email by Friday, giving them time and space to think or send your agendas 48 hours in advance so that with prepared questions that people have to be ready to answer so that they're not caught off guard, they have time to strategically think. And I think this is so important because I think one of the greatest dangers of digital communication is that the speed of it can cause groupthink. And it's one of the greatest dangers to undermine creativity within teams today. And so if you wanna really create a culture of collaboration and creativity, 
you have to create a, a culture of not of speed and rushing, but of thoughtfulness, which it involves your leadership around response time, creating pauses, creating structured time for people to think and then engage with you. That's a really interesting and powerful point, Erica. Thank you for for sharing that because absolutely having having norms, creating them and being thoughtful so that it's not just a, a a race to the bottom of, you know, oh, well, let's let's get it done without proper thought, I think is really important. A question that came up that I thought was was pretty interesting here. Lisa wants to know, is it offensive to have your profile photo up versus having your video camera on? Does it send a negative message if you're not turning on your camera? How do you think about something like that? You know, it really depends on the situation. Uh, and it's interesting because back in March, I would have a different answer than I have now six months into remote, fully remote work. So back in March, you know, a lot of leaders and my clients were asking me about, you know, how do we do this? How do we engage our teams? People aren't joining by video. They're just having their profile picture up. And I would say, you know, we have to give people some grace. Their kids are at home. They may not, they're getting new to this now. Six, seven months later, we're in a different situation. This is the new normal. Um, so it really depends on the situation in your team. So if you're leading a team and you ask everyone to join by video or you have norms around it, or you send in the calendar invite, please join by video or we'd love to do video, then obviously there's an expectation to join by video. If this is a colleague that you've worked with for a long time um, and there's no need, you you know, th there may be no pressure to do it. Um, and, and so this is where I think it's the role of the meeting host to set expectations versus leaving it vague. Because if you leave it vague, then people who don't feel like getting on video that day won't. Um, and in, you know, situations where you need video, you want to be able to engage with body language um, and see them, you know, is important and it's lost if you don't prepare. So I, I think in many ways, the answer really comes down to it's up to the meeting host to be thoughtful and to prepare. And remember that you don't always need video. There's a lot of situations where we're pushing video, uh, you know, at 5 p.m. after 10 Zoom calls when it really could be a quick phone call. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Erica. I think that's that's a really great point. And I just want to remind folks, uh, please feel free. We have, um, you know, we're coming coming into the latter part of our conversation with Erica. So if you have questions that you would like to have answered, type them into the chat box. We'd love to hear your questions. And please, uh, if you're just tuning in, feel free to let us know where you're coming from, uh, where, where you live. If you'd like to make sure you learn more about these interviews that happen every single week, here on the Newsweek LinkedIn Live channel, 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific. Uh, you can feel free to uh, to sign up for my newsletter and download some free resources at doryclark.com so you can get that and make sure that you're subscribed to the LinkedIn uh, Newsweek channel so that, uh, so that you are following that and can get notified every single time we do this. So, Erica, a great question came in here. Uh, this is you were talking about the responsibility of the moderator, which I think is a, a key piece. And uh, and so a question that came in from Annette, uh, she's calling she's coming in from uh, California. She says that some virtual communities have great facilitators. But do you have any suggestions to provide helpful feedback to those that might uh, not necessarily be doing it quite right uh, so that so that everyone can enjoy community engagement? How would you handle that if uh, if the the leader or the facilitator is uh, not quite up to snuff? Yeah, it's a great question, and we're seeing it. We're seeing some amazing meetings happen, and some really um, painful meetings happening right now. And let's be honest, it makes or breaks engagement. It makes or breaks trust. It's easier to leave the room now in digital settings. You can drop off three minutes in if it's bad. Where you know in, when you were actually in a traditional meeting, you couldn't do that. So a few things, I think this is where actually my digital body language toolkit, which we are going to provide for all of the listeners attending today, could really be helpful. Um, I developed um, a digital body language toolkit that is a style guide for best practices in video meetings, in phone meetings, in email, in IM, Slack group, chat tools, and beyond. And what it includes is a list of norms that I would recommend you could share with those moderators to create a guide that would ensure that 
we're quote unquote checking the boxes to create more successful meetings. Now, what this includes are things like when you're designing a meeting, first of all, you need to make sure that pre the meeting, you have a clear agenda. What are you going to cover? Are the right people included? Do you have the right subject line or title for the meeting? You'll be surprised how much even simple things like a title can make or break engagement. Um, if you if you're working with teams, is it clear, um, you know, who who needs to attend, who's optional? That's really helpful. So sometimes people feel fear or guilt if they don't accept. Um, but then they feel annoyed because they're not contributing. So creating optionality, if someone has to be there, making it clear. And if not, they have to allow a proxy to join in. Um, and then making sure you're designing your meeting for true engagement, psychological safety and inclusion. So what does that mean? That means if you have a large group using the group chat tool to avoid turn taking, um, to allow people to share their ideas at, this, at the same time, to not just create a structure where the extroverts are speaking up. Um, if you're presenting something, send send the information in beforehand. So you're only spending 10 minutes on it because there was an expectation that everyone reads uh, beforehand and then get into the group conversation, design questions uh, and make sure there's always a meeting note taker that is in real time drafting notes of what were the meeting goals, what came out of the meeting, who's responsible for doing what by when, and then they send it out immediately after. And I can't tell you how much the note taking makes a difference just to create a sense of clarity. We've all been in meetings where we talk about something and then the meeting two, me two weeks later, we're actually talking about what happened in the last meeting. So those are just some best practices, but I hope you'll check out the toolkit that we'll share with all of you because it will be a great, you know, one pager for you to send to those meeting hosts. That's great, Erica. Thank you. And as you can see here uh, down below, it's ericadewan.com slash dbl dash toolkit. So you can, you can get yours. So Erica, we had a terrific question come through from Elliot. Uh, he wanted to know, you know, for demo meetings or pitch zooms or meetings with, with external folks, it's probably a little harder because you can train up your colleagues uh, based on best practices. But if it's people that you're not necessarily dealing with that frequently, you may have discordant expectations. So how do you deal with that when the other people just may not really be on the same page? Yeah, so this is a very interesting one, um, especially for people that are raising money or, you know, pitching their businesses. Uh, you know, one of the things that's um, really exciting in the world of digital body language is that we can bring guests into our meetings in a way that we never could in those traditional pitch meetings um, or calls. So for example, if you're pitching your business, you can bring leading advisors that wouldn't fly to the Silicon Valley Venture Capital Fund with you to pitch, but that can join in on Zoom and use their body language to show why they care, why they support your business. If you're um, trying to engage clients uh, or pitch to clients, you can invite an existing client now into a Zoom meeting for five minutes to talk about their experience. That would never happen before because it was just too hard in face-to-face -face meetings. When it comes to the other person not engaging, um, this is where, you know, at the end of the day, uh, people are different and it really goes back to that power and trust level. There are certain people, and, and I'll describe it in two ways. Um, one thing that I've seen in my research is that there are sort of two cohorts of people and how they use digital body language. The first are digital natives who are very comfortable with digital body language, using different tools, adapting. And then the, the second type are digital adapters. Think of the digital adapters who are seeing this world of remote work, of video meetings, as like learning a new language. They feel like immigrants to this. And they're not just baby boomers, or they're not just older. I know 32-year-olds that are struggling, and I know 52-year-olds that are digital natives. So it really is a style difference. And so if you're working with um, someone that you're struggling to engage with, Ask them what their preferences are. You know, do they want to get on the phone? Do they, you know, not want to do a Zoom meeting? Obviously, there are certain things that may be better for you, but it can be helpful to actually understand people's styles. Um, some people are overwhelmed with the email right now, but if you sent them a, you know, a quick text, they get back to you. Or if you worked with their assistant, you know, you get on their calendar. Um, in those video meetings, um, if they you know, don't choose to be on Zoom and you don't have a lot of power and trust to ask them to, uh, give them some grace and work on building that trust over time. But really, the more that you model it yourself, hopefully other people will join in as you build trust with them. 
Thank you, Erica. That's great. And we have time for one more question. Guys, if you have enjoyed this conversation, uh, please like it here on, uh, on LinkedIn and also click to share it so that your colleagues can see it and participate in it and uh, also uh, marvel at exactly how smart and incisive and insightful you are for uh, giving them such high quality content. Uh, so please like and share. And of course, you can get Erica's toolkit right here, ericadewan.com dbl dash toolkit. So uh, Erica, the last question that I wanted to ask, this is one that's probably on everybody's mind. You can see neither of us is doing it here, but who knows, maybe we're missing out. The question is about virtual backgrounds. Is uh, is that good? Is that bad? Uh, what, what do we make of it when we see uh, someone who's apparently at the beach or standing somehow on top of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, or maybe they're with their, their, their pet? Who knows? virtual backgrounds yes or no uh it's up to you the reality of the world of digital body language is we have more options and it's up to us to choose what's true to us so there is no right or wrong here there is understanding what you prefer and adapting to your audience as needed so uh you know i i have found that sometimes virtual backgrounds for me can feel a little fake um, or they just don't feel right with a white virtual background. Um, sometimes I wish with my the true reality of my background is it's not perfect, it's not beautiful, but um, I know that I can focus on my, my facial cues, my engagement, my content as a way to connect with others. Um, so I would say don't get so caught up. Um, make sure it looks professional. Make sure it, uh, it doesn't, uh, especially you know if you're going into a business sales meeting, for example, um, but I would say don't feel pressured to buy a virtual background if it doesn't feel authentic or inspirational or, uh, you know, or authentic to you. All right. That's amazing. So if you if you want to conduct your meetings on top of the Golden Gate Bridge, you can. You heard it here from Erica Dewan. Uh, Erica, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Of course, your toolkit right here, ericadewan.com slash DBL dash toolkit. Make sure, of course, that you are following Erica and Newsweek and me, why not, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can learn more and uh, sign up for a newsletter at doryclark.com so you never miss a Thursday session better with Newsweek, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 Pacific. Thank you all for being here. Thank you especially Thank you, to Erica Dewan. For and the wonderful community. And thanks, Newsweek, for, um, it, you know, for creating just this amazing space for all of us. Thank you friends for tuning in and take care.